There's so many great things about tech. It's a career that doesn't require a lot of education to get into. You can build a portfolio, get hired pretty quickly. You can take care of your friends and your family. You can invest in your mental health with the money you make from tech. So I'm Nicholas Scott, pronouns he, him, and my profession is full stack engineer. So the most, first and foremost, most important identity for me is my trans identity. I'm a trans man, but also in terms of sexuality, I'd say, you know, pansexual, queer. I work specifically in like AI and blockchain. So for people who don't understand AI, I, at this point, just ask if you've interacted with ChatGPT, which is pretty much everybody. And then I say that I help companies just build apps on top of that. And for blockchain, which is a little bit more complex, I basically just ask people if they've heard of like cryptocurrency or NFTs. And then I just say that I work with the technology that powers that. I grew up in a small town, 20 minutes outside of Boston called Randolph. It's a little bit outside of Boston. It was, you know, 90s, early 2000s. I think that there was enough diversity in my neighborhood where, you know, I felt okay and, and safe there relatively. But I think comparatively now living in New York, if I were to look back on that, definitely like not enough diversity for me. As an Aries, I am like my own role model to some extent. And I think it, it just has more to do with, in a, in, a, in a deeper answer, I'm also adopted. And so, you know, growing up when there's this complexity around family and, you know, biological attachment, I think that I was so, I had to be so self-dependent at an early age that I was kind of my biggest hero at the time and also probably a little distrusting of a lot of adults. So I think role model was like a very strong thing for me that I didn't really give out so easily, but I definitely think that I took influence. I got my work ethic from my mom. You know, I got a lot of great qualities that I picked up from my dad. And then definitely I owe my brother, I owe it to my brother for my intellect and my wit. Probably senior year, I think I actually came out. And I think the reason I didn't question it sooner is, well, one, I went to an all girls private school when I lived in Boston. And you'd think maybe as a trans man that that could have been maybe a dysphoric, early dysphoric experience for me, but it actually wasn't. It was a really supportive environment. And then because there wasn't that co-ed complex experience, I didn't have to worry about like dating or things like that. I was just so focused on myself and my studies that I didn't really even feel the need to kind of question these deeper parts of me. I think I could say that just probably like every trans person, there was like a lot of early experiences where I felt these things, but didn't have the language for it. But I think, yeah, around like senior year when people started talking a little bit about bisexuality more, I think like a lot of, musicians talked about it more, so it was becoming more mainstream. I guess that's when I was empowered with language and, you know, came out and that was a positive experience. You know, I, I didn't really expect it to be negative. I have a progressive family, but my mom was, you know, super excited, went and told everybody at her job. They told her to send congratulations to me. So I felt really supported in that. Maybe one of the reasons it was so easy for me to come out is that my mom had a lot of queer friends and brought them around a lot. So I think it was just very normalized and I was exposed to it early, but as far as just defined spaces, I don't think I saw a lot of that. I definitely have to credit that one to my mom. She worked at Fidelity Investments in Boston and you know, she'd bring me to work with her all the time and working in a big company like that, you know, of course they've got a bunch of engineers, they've got computer labs. It's the early 2000s after the big dot-com boom thing. So tech was starting to be really big and yeah, I think she was just trying to figure out how to like entertain me for so long at work. She just dumped me in the computer lab and just my curiosity and shout out to search engines being available at the time. I think I would just literally search anything that came to mind. And one day I was just like, oh, how do you make a website? You know, and I read it. And then two hours later, I started doing it. And I think that's how I taught myself like HTML. You know, as I got older, a couple years still going to work with her, I would start Googling, you know, how do I like make video game systems? Like how do people make game consoles? And I actually learned about like electronic engineering. So a lot of it was just coincidental curiosity at my mom's work and then just having access to a lot of those tech resources and books in her job. You know, and I think it's just because of the time and the generation where college was still expected of a lot of people when I was younger. That's the path your parents want you to go on. And then also 
you know, I don't think a lot of people thought that they could be in tech, at, you know, at that early uh, of when I was in like, you know, elementary and middle school. And so it didn't look like a reasonable career path in a conventional sense. A lot of my early life, it was just a hobby. I guess this gets into the complexity of traditional education and kind of some of the frustrations I have with it is, you know, after we just kind of like left my private school, which was great, I had a lot of great resources there. I really loved learning. Learning was fun in that school. But then when we had to move to North Carolina, uh, like my mom's job, I went to a public school and it was still a pretty good school. But, you know, when you have to educate a lot of kids, sometimes the quality gets lost. Teaching 10 kids in a classroom is a lot different than like 20 or 30. And so I, th I think my passion for learning dropped and I stopped kind of nurturing my passions with tech, just trying to navigate as like a teenager at that point. And I then math became really hard for me. I failed algebra two twice to a point where I almost wasn't even going to be able to walk to graduate. It was such a blow to me considering how well I'd done academically, you know, at my private school. And I just felt like the learning environment in the public school wasn't suited for me and kind of like I was being punished. And then you get a lot of that limiting language, right? I think I just made that assumption that if I'm not good at math, there's no way I could be a professional programmer. There's no way I can make video games or websites. And so I just shut that dream away for like a really long time. Things were shifting in our generation where, you know, college was getting expensive. People were starting to deal with mental health. And so my brother, you know, dropped out of like, you know, GW it was a big shock to the family. I think they did not want to go through that stress with me. So at that point they were like, Nick, like, don't waste our money. If you don't want to go, don't go. And so I had the time to kind of really sit and think about what I wanted to do. I think I intuitively knew that what I was meant to do or what I wanted to do wasn't in a college curriculum yet at that time. And so I think I followed my instincts and just didn't take it too serious. But to kind of protect myself, I was like, you know, maybe I should just go for a little bit of the experience get a couple core classes that would benefit me anywhere. I knew I was really interested in psychology and communications. So I just went for fun. And, you know, my brother gave me really good advice. He said, you know, college is what you make out of it. So I knew I didn't have to go with the intention of leaving with a degree, but I could go and get what I wanted out of it. And that's exactly what I did. And so I left maybe after a couple semesters, I was like, okay, this really isn't for me. I don't think I could do this for another few years. And then I just did, you know, stuff to survive. I worked at like Dunkin' Donuts, moved into retail. I think as my trans identity was starting to surface, you know, in, in my early 20s, men's fashion became like a really affirming place to be. And so that's what made me pick up all my stuff and come to New York. I was like, I'm going to get a job in fashion. I want to start my transition here. That's exactly what I did. I became a stylist. I worked at a lot of great like fashion stores here, even got to participate in like some fashion week stuff. But I think as I became more confident in my transition, starting the hormones, feeling more affirmed in the world, I didn't feel like I needed to rely on it so much anymore. And I think life just naturally brought me back to the passion and I started orienting towards tech. And it wasn't until I just kind of rediscovered it over these past couple of years, which maybe we could get into, but yeah, it was an unconventional path. I, I had to do a lot of things before I got back here you know, exactly how I got where I am at, over the past couple of years was self-education because all the HTML and stuff I learned when I was younger is great. It was fundamental, but it's not like I dove really deep into it and it's really evolved over the years. But it was really these past three to four years that I really buckled down and just disciplined myself. And it's incredible how much formal education you don't need for it. I mean, everything I know and the job I have, I mean, I think it's incredible that you can open yourself to a six figure career just by learning off of YouTube, which is exactly what I did. Maybe I dropped a couple hundred bucks on like some Udemy courses here and there, but it wasn't a requirement, but it was really just like me disciplining myself to sit in front of my laptop nine hours a day, sacrifice going out with friends, sacrifice dating for many years. I gave it the same energy I would have if I was in college, but it was just on my own terms. So yeah, I mean, I think it's great that I didn't really need a lot of resources to get into it. You know, my recommendation aside from learning the fundamentals like HTML, CSS, and honestly, you can learn that. I, I, I mean, at that point, they're fundamentals. You're kind of going to have to dig around. There's so many people offering that education for free. It really just depends on which resource you respond to. There's some sites that have like interactive learning environments. There's some, you know, maybe YouTube if you learn better with video. So I think it's first about 
understanding the way you learn and then trying to seek out those types of resources or those types of mediums. But then I guess my recommendation, and this is really just what worked for me, is web development frameworks, learning, you know, full stack JavaScript, uh, React, because there's so many languages, you know, there's Python, you know, C, those things are very specific. And I don't want to say they're hard to get a job in, but like, everybody needs a website, everybody's trying to build the next startup and most platforms and services and social media sites that we use are pretty much normal full stack languages. So I think there's just a greater availability for those types of jobs. I think they're easier to get your head around. And then if you want to kind of dive into those more advanced languages, you can. But if we're talking about what does it take for me to learn something in like three to six months where I could p potentially build a portfolio and get hired pretty quickly, I recommend like full stack JavaScript. So another important, you know, stepping stone to talk about is that I actually started in digital marketing first. And that was just because, you know, as I said, I was kind of working in retail and minimum wage in New York gets exhausting pretty quickly. And I just remember have caffeinating myself, having panic attacks and anxiety all the time. I was like, I gotta do something about this. And so you start reading about what are other people doing online. I'm seeing now at this time, 2014, 2015, bloggers are a big thing. That was so inspirational to see people could just kind of create their own career just by having, you know, an Instagram account or something like that. So I think I was seeing that we're entering this space where you really can kind of create your own career. Again, thinking about fashion, looking at bloggers, to me, it was all marketing. So that's kind of where I started. I'm like, what are they doing? And so I'm reading about it. And then I kind of fall into these rabbit holes of people that are teaching you how to get started with digital marketing, how to like sell your own products and market them. And it was all very cool. But what I learned is that when I started working under people and working for people and just trying to get gigs and stuff like that, I found that I was gravitating more towards marketing automation, which was the technical side of marketing. It seemed like a lot of these people knew how to market, but as far as how to scale it and automate things, they didn't really know how to do that. And it came natural to me. And I think I credit that to my early interest in you know, technology. And so that came really quick to me and I just started orienting more towards that. And then I got really good at marketing automation to the point that I actually started my own startup, which was just a random idea one day. Marketing automation for me was like automating customer service. So at the time I was learning about how to make like messenger bots for business. What really clicked for me that like I could build the life I wanted was when somebody hired me to build them a messenger bot. I didn't even need to use coding. I used a platform that just drag and drop whatever. And I sold it for $5,000. And I was like, wow, this is like half the money I've made in like a year working in retail. And I was like, I just did this in like two hours. And I was like, something just started clicking for me. So I just started diving in. I built an entire business around it. I built an entire startup around it. I got accepted into a tech accelerator. And yeah, I like met a co-founder after that. We ended up selling the IP for that technology, which was really interesting. So just because of like the world that I, I was in and also maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome and not having a formal education in engineering, I think I always knew, well, I'm never going to be at the Netflix. I'm never going to be, you know, an Amazon engineer. And so I think I shot lower and not in like a, I was settling, but I just had to look at different places. It was kind of like a David and Goliath thing. I was just trying to be creative, knowing the maybe disadvantage that I'd be at. And interestingly enough, having to think creatively like that brought me into spaces that I don't think a lot of people do think to look in, but I think are really great for starting out and getting hired. And so being in this online world, learning about all these digital marketers and entrepreneurs, these were like really successful people and to just have them immediately available, like in my network, getting invited out to conferences. That's where I learned conferences are like the best place to kind of get those kind of jobs because it's not to say that the Netflix execs aren't going to be there, but you're going to see a lot more startups at these places, right? And these startups, in my opinion, are a little bit more inclusive. They are a little bit more kind of family oriented. You don't get into those tough politics, I think, until you get into big corporations. And also it's room for people to just kind of learn you naturally. I mean, I remember one of my first 
jobs that ended up becoming like a really great client, really great friendship was just like a natural connection I made at a conference I was speaking at in Puerto Rico. We're at the same conference, we're speaking, we end up being in the same friend circle, end up going to the same dinners, just naturally getting to know each other more. And then next thing I know, like a week later before I leave, like we were working on a project together. And then he ended up being the guy who like, hired me for like the next three years and like made me head of product in his company. Obviously he knew like my, how important my transness was to me. I felt comfortable sharing that because of the space we were in, but I think it's a little bit more difficult to do that in like a big corporate setting. I don't look for the job when I go there. I look for the connection and I look for like alignment and you know, I'm more interested in just, I'm a visionary person, I'm an innovative person. I like talking to other successful people that are working on big projects. So it really just starts out as natural conversation. And then, you know, if you do believe in your, your skills and you are trying to sell yourself, you should go into these conversations thinking about how can you add value to like what they're working on and just kind of don't pitch it aggressively, but you know, pitch it organically. And an example of that is, you know, at the conference I was talking about this guy that I had, would end up working for was also speaking and he's like a big, you know, trader, you know, a lot of traders know him and he's a, an influential name for sure. I didn't know him because I didn't know anything about trading, but you know, he's at this conference, he's doing some thought leadership on like what, where he thinks trading needs to go, how, how automation can benefit certain parts of it. And he was talking, he gave this big speech on how the emotion needs to be automated out of trading because that's how a lot of people kind of end up in trouble. Again, not knowing anything about trading, we're at this like tech conference and his call to action was just like, you know, I know what needs to be done, but I don't know how to build the algorithm, so to speak. And so he's calling out to all these engineers there at the conference, you know, come work with me and help me. And again, at this time, I wasn't half as good as engineering as, as I am now. I was just getting started. I was more so focused on product and marketing. But I listened to him and I you know, saw all these other engineers going up to him, trying to give him these algorithms and stuff. And I'm thinking, well, that's not right. They don't even know enough about his company like to even recommend an algorithm at this point. And again, the, the product side of me, the person I think who thinks more practically and wasn't just trying to get a job and impress him, I was like, I think he's actually asking the wrong question. And I had the courage to kind of go up to him and say, you know, I don't think at this point, you need to be finding an algorithm to automate the emotions out of trading. I was like, that's a lot of data points that you need to acquire over many, many years to even build an algorithm. I was like, I think the question you need to be asking now is how do I gather these analytics? How do I understand the emotions that lead to bad trades and then build an algorithm around that? And just having the confidence to kind of think, how am I different from all of these other people who are pitching him? And that just started off as a gradual conversation. He was like, yeah, you know, let's talk about it more. But you also have to have the instincts when you're at these places that not everyone wants to talk about work all the time, you know? So it's like we balance those conversations with just kind of getting to know each other and, and meeting each other as friends. And that's what you're going to need to have working at companies like that small. That's the trade off that they are looking for connection and chemistry. So you've got to build that as well. For AI, it's tough. I'm actively dealing with, I don't want to say internal conflict, but it's like, I know what I'm doing is automating some people out of jobs. And so I have to think about what does that mean to me? But I also know that my goal and my end game is AI is profitable right now for an engineer. And so with the money that I'm getting from doing it, how can I reinvest that back into my community and try to kind of offset the impact of AI? And so that's really my goal is to just work in these emerging technology spaces where there's a small percentage of people that are capable of doing it, which means you're likely to get paid more. And my goal is to, yeah, just like get paid as much as I can and then just redistribute that wealth back into my community. It, sound like a cliche, but it does not feel like work. I mean, if you talk to anybody who knows me, who's dated me, I've never cheated on anybody in my life, but if you talk to a select few ex-girlfriends of mine, they will say that it felt like I cheated on them with my computer. I have this obnoxious like 49 inch monitor, like this workstation and everything like that. And even on the weekends, like I will get up and code for fun and like do not talk to me for like four or five hours. And I think some people don't understand that. Like, Nick, it's weekend, you're not working today. I was like, but I'm working on my stuff. Like I'm having fun right now. And it's fun to be able to say that. 
And even on a more serious note, you know, not to get too dark, but uh, I guess another identity I forgot to include that's really important to me and important to me now is a couple years ago, I got diagnosed uh, with HIV and darkest, darkest times of my life. But the one thing that got me up again in the morning after weeks and weeks of depression and not getting out of bed was coding. I literally say that coding saved my life because there's been so many times with things like that, diagnoses or even just mental health dips, you know, suicidal thoughts, everything that helped me navigate that was recentering and just kind of focusing on my passion. Anytime I feel sad, any like a breakup, you name it, thought, I, you know, suicidal ideation. When that happens, of course, I go seek out my therapist. And then when I'm done with that, I go sit myself in front of the computer and I code. And somehow it just always brings me back to like my center and my purpose and makes me feel good about being here. For me, if I can't talk about it, if I can't celebrate it, it's not the workplace for me. And again, I don't know if this is like privilege because I have the ability to kind of say yes and no to jobs that I want right now, but it's important to me. Like I'm not just trying to get hired. I'm trying to hire you. Like I have to work with you for the next however many years. I wanna make sure this is a good fit for me. So if I don't feel like I can celebrate my identity, if I don't feel like I can talk about it, then you know, you're not the company for me. And like a good example of that is that guy I was telling you about in Puerto Rico, you know, around the time that, you know, the George Floyd thing happened and all the protests were happening, his business partner who, you know, he's white, you know, maybe doesn't mean the same thing to him as it does to me, but what felt, you know, really special was that he messaged me that day and he was like, Nick, he was like, I can't even begin to empathize with what you're going through. He's like, but you know, if you want to take the day off and things like that, you know, feel free to do that. And, you know, he asked me if I went to any protests and even just kind of asking me what that experience was like. I don't think I would have gotten that in a big corporation. So like th that feels nice that, you know, they thought of those things. I mean, one of the most transformative types of introspection I've done you know, I was working with like an advisor slash investor of mine, really good friend. And long story short, I had started another startup and I actually raised capital for it, which was a huge milestone as a black trans person. That just doesn't happen. And it was a, a friend of mine and somebody who had, you know, worked with me from the beginning and kind of saw my growth over the years and really special that he believed in me enough to kind of invest in me and the venture. But some unfortunate circumstances happened where after I received that capital, I moved to Puerto Rico and a bunch of earthquakes happened while I was in Puerto Rico, like three months in, and it really just kind of shook me up. And I think I, at that point, I was really desperate for grounding both in a literal and kind of emotional sense. And I think it was all these questions that I had over the years of, am I a jack of all trades? You know, how, I, how did I land in marketing to product to tech? Like, what am I really doing? Am I really good at anything? Am I a specialist in anything? And I had all these questions, all this imposter syndrome. And I think at that point I knew I'm not ready to finish building or growing this startup. And I'm not gonna do my investor like any favors if I don't work on these kind of internal barriers first. And I said, I need to find that inner confidence and kind of really break through this imposter syndrome. And I was like, you know, let me just kind of work in some successful companies and see how they do it, you know? And that's when I ended up taking a job with that guy I met in Puerto Rico. He made me head of product. I worked with him full time for like, you know, almost three years. And Around that time that that was happening, that I made that decision, I had to find the courage to tell my investor, I don't think I can finish this company anymore. And thank God he was so supportive of it, you know, because he's also really big on, you know, mental health and things like that. And he actually worked with me to kind of uncover what some of those internal barriers were. And I ended up writing, you know, my first kind of personal essay about how I think that my biracial and transgender experience shaped my career. And I kind of tried drawing parallels to, okay, well, if I had to walk through this world kind of juggling masculine and feminine energy and, and you know, the perspective of being in a black and white family and trying to pull together all those influences and all those perspectives that dominated my life, maybe there's a reason 
that I've never gravitated to just one thing. Maybe there's a reason that I am good at multiple things because I have these perspectives. And maybe that in fact is a superpower and like not a weakness. And after writing that, I think that was what I needed to kind of like feel good about myself. So I just kind of went forward, did some time in that company to feel like I was, you know, watching experts. And then, yeah, I'm kind of at this point now where I'm revisiting what it might look like to, you know, revive my startup energy. I don't necessarily think that tech is not inclusive. I think it's about finding the right companies that are, and some people don't know how to do that. I think that was something that came a little natural for me and privileged too. I mean, I, I'm fortunate, you know, my dad let me stay in his apartment in New York. I'm not paying rent. So I had the time to kind of figure things out. And I know other people, especially a lot of queer people and marginalized people don't have that luxury of doing that. So I, I definitely also credit that and that's not something that everybody can recreate. I think that there's room for us there. I think that it's there's a lower barrier to entry than a lot of other fields. I just think that I guess maybe more people like me need to be the visibility and, and help elevate other people into these spaces. In tech and engineering, I think the sentiment is when a lot of people think of tech that it's like a tech bros club and they think of, you know, the stereotypical founder in California who has no, you know, realistic perspective on what's going on in the world. And, you know, in some cases that's true. But like I said, there's different pockets of this. If you know where to look, where there are people who want to make an impact, where there are people that, you know, care about diversity and inclusion. And it's not just like a vanity thing for them to flex at the company. There's definitely smaller spaces that you have to explore, I think, as a queer person to get in the right spaces, but they do exist. I think we all know the risk of AI, you know, and what happens when only a specific group of people with a sp specific experience are training these models and, you know, certain perspectives and experiences are being left out. I think that's why more of us need a seat at the table. And also just because it's a no brainer. I mean, to me, tech is a very profitable career that does not require a lot of time to get into it. And I think that's essential for trans people and trans people of color, especially, I mean, in New York, it's no secret to the trans community that so many people are unhoused and homeless. And for trans women, a lot of them don't even get hired in spaces because of the bias in workplaces and they're kind of reduced to nothing but like sex work, you know? I think that more, you know, companies should be trying to elevate and uplift trans people and trans people of color and kind of bring them into these spaces. Because me personally, I don't think I would be half as far and fulfilled in my transition if not only I didn't have a fulfilling career, but also being a, the money that I got from this career, being able to invest in things like trauma therapy, which is so essential, knowing that I can order like healthy food all the time and just not ever really having to worry about finances. And even when I do get hit, you know, I think I got laid off for my first time three months ago and I was not scared because I felt like I had all the money up here because of everything I learned and I knew it would be no time before I get hired again. I want you know, my people, I want trans people to have that, that same confidence and that same access. I want to see more of us in these important positions, particularly in tech, just kind of leading the charge on innovation, especially black trans women. I don't, you know, again, I think that sex work is a legitimate career and there's some people who really enjoy it. So I don't want to speak from a perspective because I haven't had to do it. I don't want to kind of do that savior thing like, oh, we need to get people out of that. If you feel fulfilled in that work, that's great. But I know that there's a lot of girls who would love to be doing something else and they just can't. For the girls who are doing it because they need to and not because they want to, I wanna see more platforms and, and more outreach and just more resources to, to get our people into these positions. Just for trans people in particular, which is who I wanna advocate for the most and trans people of color, you know, what I really want is to kind of change our perspective and negative sentiment on tech. I don't, when we hear tech, I don't want us to just think about, you know, exploitation and how much money Jeff Bezos has and Elon Musk is the worst because yes, you know, those are big people in tech, but that's not all that tech has to offer. And another thing that I hear a lot of like trans people, specifically people who are more activist oriented than I am, a lot of times 
there's this, am I kind of giving in and participating in capitalism by even getting a job in there? And that's a conversation that everybody's gonna have to have with themselves internally. But if you're going into it for the right reasons, if you're not you know, contributing to that exploitation and if you're using that money to invest it back into yourself and your community and we need that the most, we need extra resources, I think that it's beneficial for us to try to get into these positions. You don't have to become Elon Musk by getting a job in tech, but you can take care of your friends and your family. You can pay your rent, you can eat better, you can invest in your mental health. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I would like more people to get excited about tech. As much as I challenged authority and followed my own path then, I would tell myself to challenge authority even more because I know for a fact, if I did not get caught up in all that, oh, should I go to college? Should I not? Should I work in this or you know, climb the corporate ladder at Dunkin' Donuts? If I knew what I knew now, I would have told myself to just keep coding. As soon as I learned it when I was a kid, just stick with it. My God, I would have been a millionaire probably in my early 20s if I had stuck on that path. And yeah, I probably would have told myself, yeah, you know, entertain your family, finish high school, get through it, but like, all those times where I felt lost because I was like, what should I be doing? What does society want me to do? If I could have silenced those voices immediately and just dove into what I'm doing now, I'd be much further. It let go of any limiting voice inside yourself that you know says you can't do it or you need X, Y, Z to do this. You don't need to be a math whiz to do it. I still need a calculator for absolutely everything. And yet here I am six figures in tech. So that's not necessary. You don't need a college degree for it. I think, I don't even know if I mentioned this, but I think it's important to emphasize that I would actually argue against going to college for programming, mostly because technology evolves, but even coding languages and the frameworks evolve so quickly that by the time it's that curriculum is even written and approved and then taught over the course of six months, it is pretty much outdated by the time you're done. And so whatever you can learn six months, a year in college, you can learn two weeks to a couple months online. And so I'd say get your education wherever it's available to you. If you have a phone, if you have a laptop, that is literally all you need.